Ralph Turner, but I'm known in the Aboriginal community and others as Uncle Boydie. And uh, I'm in my 88th year. Life was pretty hard in the uh, 1930s and beyond. And our mothers taught us uh, if, if we saw a big black car, which is the car that uh, government authorities drove at that time, if you see a big black car coming into the mission, run and hide. There was a car came in when I was in school and a kid ran to the door and said, they're coming. And up jumped all the kids and left the school. But I ran down, I couldn't swim, I ran down sang out across the river, Mum, bring the boat. And she was a little bit long bringing it, bringing it. And I said, if you don't bring it, I'll jump in the river. I couldn't swim. I would have drowned. But I was that frightened, I would have. They used to tell the kids, that uh, the parents, that they were taking the kids to the doctor or the dentist or somewhere. They'd take them into Moama, place named Moama, put them on a train, and they'd be up in Sydney that night. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a sad, a sad yeah. picture for Australian history, yeah. this one. My name is Moshe Fishman. I was born in Poland in the city of Radom, which is 104 kilometres south of Warsaw. My family was there for centuries. Our life in Poland, we expected trouble. And we tried, the parents tried to send their children away overseas to other countries if possible. The ghetto was an open jail. Just imagine 30,000 people were crammed in into a part of the poorest part of town. On top of it being locked up, the food situation got from bad to worse because everything else was confiscated and we were living only on ration cards. And we tried. We tried uprising with what? Yeah, yeah. The first uprising against the German might was in the Warsaw Ghetto. 250 boys and girls began an uprising with 15 rifles. We yeah. tried everywhere, wherever we could. There were partisan movement. But yeah. what could you do? You were surrounded. Kristallnacht, the German government, decided upon one of the largest pogroms in Europe. They smashed every single Jewish business. They burned down every single prayer house or synagogue in the whole country of Germany. And they took about 40,000 people into the concentration camps of Dachau. This was in the paper. I can remember the, those stories being in the paper. And. Uh, after about a month, William Cooper could see that no one else was going to do anything for these people. So he decided that he would. So he organised the march. They marched to the Nazi uh, government ambassador and tried to give him the petition. Yes. Uh, and they wouldn't come out and talk to him, so he left the uh, petition there and the letter. I can only tell you regarding, in my point of view as a survivor, it's just, it's just uh, something I, I, cannot, I cannot imagine. I mean, after all, the Aborigines were not exactly treated as everyone else in, this, in the country. And to come down and to protest to the German council in, in front of people he's never met is just an unbelievable thing. Unbelievable. He was an unbelievable man. I uh, knew uh, that the, my grandfather would do something like that, the man he was, because I'd lived with him for uh, eight or nine years, and uh, he would do, I uh, wasn't fussed a bit about that at all, how he come to do it, hmm. because I knew he would do it. It's yes, just, he it's was just... one of those people that, uh, cared about his fellow man. And I might add, uh, the people that stuck by him and marched with him, yeah. were, they, uh, they were uh, mainly Aboriginal people. Yeah, because the, the Aboriginal pe people 
could could feel what happened to us mm. in Europe, mm. because they themselves were were That's were right. subjected to a lot of a lot of a lot of, of problems yeah, down yeah. here. That's right. Well, William Cooper wanted to be uh, his paper to be represented in Parliament, but uh, he wanted more or less. Uh, people to be uh, able to go out into the wider world and, and get a job or, and to live like uh, other Australians live. Lots of people don't know that. Lots, lots of Aboriginal people don't know that. That we had leaders in nearly every state of Australia. That uh, they were a minority in those times and they couldn't do what they were trying to do. It's only come about after they died that some of the things they fought for uh, we were able to uh, enjoy. So uh, his, work, his work wasn't, uh, you know, um, done uh, for, for themselves. Yeah. Everything was done for their people. Yeah. My father, 54 years of age. My sister was 21 years. The children were 12 and 13. Yeah. They married them all. As far as I am concerned, I was left on my own out of a family of over 200 people. We were only about three people left of the whole family. How we made it, I don't know. It's only, no. it's only fate. Fate decided that I should make it. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Yeah. I'm glad Thank you're here, mate. Thank you. Glad you're here. Thank you. I've uh, been very happy to come down and meet you and to listen to you with your uh, knowledge of those times. I'm very grateful to, to know you. I think it's terrible that uh, that happened and I'm very sorry that you uh, about your family, losing your family. Thank you very much. First of all, for telling us the story about your grandfather and about your childhood. Your grandfather was a great man. Mm -hmm. He's a great man. I mean, if you, if you can call Gandhi uh, the great man in India, you can call William yes. Cooper a great yes. man in Australia for his own people. And for us, people at the time which were sentenced to death to be annihilated and we had someone, at least, someone yeah. who thought about us, protested, went there. As an Aboriginal man, it is an incredible story. Mm -hmm. Incredible and unbelievable. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you.